So last time I saw you guys, which was a long time ago, we talked about what is law. You guys have answered some discussion posts on some, uh, you know, uh, complicated debates. But before we move on to those complicated debates, there is this overarching paradigm kind of perspective that we need to talk about. And that's conflict versus consensus paradigms. And basically what these paradigms try and answer are why are laws created and do some people benefit from laws more than other people? This is particularly relevant in society today. Um, it was also especially relevant last week when there were supposed to be scholar protests that, that happened and what I would have talked about with your comrades had any of them actually shown up last Wednesday. They took an extended Labor Day, I guess. So, the first paradigm we're going to talk about is the consensus paradigm. Basic idea about consensus paradigms of law are though the interests in society often differ, the building of consensus is essential to secure and maintain order. So we all have different ideas. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. It doesn't matter if you're white, black, brown, green, or blue. We all have different ideas about life. However, law is the purpose of law is to secure and maintain order by building consensus. Let's come up with some things we all agree on, make that legal. Let's come up with compromises to certain situations we can't agree on so that society can still function. The primary function of the legal system is integrity. That's important. It serves to mitigate potential elements of conflict and oil the machinery of social intercourse. Isn't that sound fun? Um, we're oiling machinery to make things actually function properly. So it may be true that men have been advantaged in life over time professionally, that men make more money on average than women. So what are some ways society can address those issues? We could fire all men and just hire all women. Is that the most satisfying solution to the problem? Probably not. Who would probably not love that plan? Men. I personally would be a really good stay-at-home husband. So I'd be totally fine with that, as long as we didn't have kids and we had a house cleaner and a yard guy. I would play tennis, do bon bon and cat brush my soap operas. I'd live the drink. But for some reason my wife wants me to work. So men wouldn't like that. So what's a way we can address this issue? Do we just keep women oppressed? We could require some sort of hiring practices or companies could establish hiring practices to prioritize women applicants over men to try and cause this to even out, right? There could be ways we could compromise and say, okay, right now there are too many men in executive positions. So our priority, you know, George is retiring. Let's make it a priority to replace him with the most qualified female applicant we can find. Right? There are ways, and that seems like a very logical, very reasoned compromise. Right? From a consensus paradigm, that's basically what it is, is it is a trying to come to some sort of compromise. So there's three C's of the consensus paradigm. Consensus of values, cooperation, and compromise, right? The law represents agreed upon norms of society. Overwhelmingly, the vast majority of people in society, right? Not everyone loves gay marriage, but the vast majority of people do, so gay marriage is legal, right? Because we have a consensus of values. We have cooperation, right? We all have to kind of agree that certain things need to happen. Even if you don't agree with gay marriage, right? If someone comes to your hotel and says, me and my husband are going to get a room here, cooperate and let them have a room even if you personally don't agree with it, right? But then compromise. Groups work together to maintain order and the functioning of society, right? We all know what compromise is. So some laws obviously represent a consensus model better than others. Most people agree murder is bad, robbery is bad. What about abortion? Does everyone more or less have the same opinion on abortion? Not really. What about drug laws? Not really. Right, and so there are some clear examples of consensus um, laws that make sense and others that don't. 
Now let's contrast that with conflict paradox. There are two basic types of conflict, group conflict and elitist conflict, and these are different. So group conflict, law results from a power differential between competing groups. Republican versus Democrat, men versus women, white versus black, old versus young, right? Um, group power changes over time though. When Barack Obama was first elected president, Democrats controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency. As time went on, Congress moved more to the left. Then Donald Trump got elected president and Republicans controlled both houses of Congress and the presidency and Congress has moved, I'm sorry, under Barack Obama moved more to the right and now under Donald Trump it's moved more toward the left, right? Power can be measured in different ways. Also coercive monetary and ideological power, right? Coercive power could be do this or something bad will happen to you, right? Monetary power, I control the money, therefore I control who gets the money, therefore I control if you want my money, here's you're gonna get it. And ideological, ideological in society today tends to be the biggest way people are coercive. How are Republicans and Democrats being ideologically uh, powerful in society today? Why are Republicans arguing you should vote for Donald Trump over Joe Biden? Go ahead. I see a lot of uh, this is the most morally degenerate version of the other party that we've ever seen. Right. So, so both sides, right? That's that's a good thing. Both sides say the other party is the worst it's ever been in the history of ever. Right. Donald Trump and his supporters are the next Hitler mixed with the Antichrist and they had a love child, right? Democrats, though, are what? Communists, right? They're trying to push us into being like Cuba and Venezuela and other places that are communists, China. Um, and there's huge ideological arguments. If you vote for Donald Trump, basically you're acknowledging you're a Nazi. Do you know anyone that walks around proudly screaming from the rooftops, I love Donald Trump? Yes, we all know those people. Do we like to associate with them? Even if we agree with them, do we like to associate with them? No, because we're worried about what? Getting judged or jumped, right? Because <laughs> people are not happy <laughs> with our current president, right? You can be very openly a Joe Biden supporter, though. Right? Can you not? Why not? Well, people condemn me for who I support. Yeah. Right? Let's take, and this is a beautiful example of the world and conflict theory playing out in the world today. What is the debate about mail in voting? So, well, there's a debate about it. That's one side of it. One side is arguing mail in voting is open for corruption and fraud and fake. What's the other side? Why are they arguing for mail and voting? You'll die if you vote in person. COVID, right? You could get disease. And also, what does mail and voting do? It allows more people to vote. What was the problem with 20, the 2016 election? Why did Donald Trump win the 2016 election? Well, that's why anyone wins any presidential election. <laughs> right. Right. Even though the majority vote is because of the areas that vote Donald Trump. Well, right. So, so yes, but how was voter turnout is really what I was getting at. How was voter turnout in 2016? It was not great. Republicans showed up in force. Democrats, why did they not show up? Not enough votes. Well, <laughs> They could have won, right? But why was the Democratic Party so or disenchanted so they didn't vote? Were they in love with Hillary Clinton? Mm -hmm. No, they did not like Hillary Clinton because the Democratic Party, if actually left to their own devices, would have probably nominated who? Bernie Sanders. But super delegates, which are people, just random people, and this is where this is a, a huge irony, the Democratic Party doesn't like the Electoral College, but they love superdelegates to get Hillary Clinton elected. 
these unrepresented people that have more power than the actual people in the Democratic caucus picked Hillary Clinton, even though the people wanted Bernie Sanders. They were so upset that Hillary Clinton won, they just said, screw it, we're not voting. We're not showing up. Also, people have a hard time getting off of work to vote, have a hard time getting to polling places to vote. So from a group conflict standpoint, Republicans don't want mail-in voting because probably what will happen? Donald Trump would lose. But at the same time, what's the real reason Democrats want mail in voting? Because Donald Trump would lose, right? Because it's people don't want to be bothered. People aren't happy with Joe Biden right now either. Who do you know that's like, finally, we nominated someone I love? Not no one, right? Maybe Joe Biden's wife. Um, but the Democratic Party is equally worried that people are just not going to show up, and Trump supporters are ardent Trump supporters, right? They're going to want to show up to see him get a second term. But if we make it as easy as possible to vote, by mailing the ballot to your house, you just scribble on it, drop it in a postage paid envelope, and mail it back, maybe we can beat Donald Trump. This is the same reason, you know, Emma brings up the Electoral College. This is the same reason why liberals, after George W. Bush and Donald Trump got elected, demanded getting rid of the Electoral College, right? And I'm not saying that that's how Emma feels, but because the Democratic Party lost, the popular vote means nothing in our elections, right? The Electoral College is how you get elected. Why did Hillary Clinton lose the Electoral College? She only went to like three states when she campaigned. She bounced from California, New York to Florida. Maybe she spent a little bit of time in Texas. She ignored the whole middle of the country. If you're running an election, right, if you're trying to get the whole country to vote for you and you need the Electoral College to win, even if you're not necessarily a huge Trump supporter, Trump showed up. The other candidate didn't, but told you from New York how much she cared about you. Who do you like more, the friend that shows up or the friend that tells you from a distance how much they really love you, but they're not going to see you or spend any time with you? Right? So they we, we call on changing the system in a conflict paradigm, especially a group conflict paradigm. How can we change the rules for my side to win? How can we change the rules for men to stay in power? and not women? How can we change the rules to keep white people in power? As a straight white male, I'm all the things, right? So clearly I can get a job. So how, from a college perspective, of course I'm a college professor here, right? It didn't matter who I went up against. I had all the privilege lined up to get that job, right? So when you watch politics on a national stage, when you watch these things unfold, is mail-in ballot, are, are mail-in votes really that corrupt? No, probably not. In fact, I don't ever wait in line. I always fill out an absentee ballot and vote by mail because I don't want to be bothered showing up someplace, right? The problem is you have to apply for your absentee ballot weeks before the election, and you have to have it in like a week before the election in order to have your vote actually count. Both sides come up with these ideological arguments. No, 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 because we arrested this one guy who changed three ballots. Therefore, mail-in voting is corrupt. On the flip side, what is the Democratic Party? No, 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 this allows more people to vote. Isn't society better if more people vote? Not if the people were too lazy to drive to the voting place to begin with, right? Are they informed voters? Probably not, right? And so it, from a conflict perspective, and especially group conflict perspective, Everything that's happening is just what? Jockeying for power, right? That's all they're trying to do is jockey for power. Even though group power changes over time, we make these arguments. And in fact, every political argument is ideological. Republicans are pro-life, right? We like life. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, I like life too. If the options are death or life, yeah, I think I'm going to pick life. Do Democrats walk out and say, we are pro-death? Of course not. What are they? 
Pro, well, hell, I like pro-choice too. I like the idea of choice. I don't want the government telling me what I can and can't do. Both sound really good, right? And so we use these ideological arguments for um, all sorts of things to try and maintain power. Elitist conflict is basically the exact same, except for we're not talking about groups where power changes. Law is the tool by which the ruling class exercises its control. So instead of Republicans, Democrats, it's who's in power as a homogenous class, and then those that are not in power. So like 1% versus 99%, right? Law is a hegemonic strategy. Hegemonic strategy basically means it's how people maintain and legitimize their power. Why in the world do we care at all what Bill Gates has to say about coronavirus? Because he's the second wealthiest man in the world. He started Microsoft. Does that make him an epidemiologist? Does he know anything about viruses and disease control and infections? I would trust the hell out of him to reprogram my computer. Although I have a Mac, he probably wouldn't like it. But that. Um, but still, he for some reason is a very wide voice in this COVID conversation. For some reason, right? Law both protects the property of the powerful and represses political threats. Part of the reason why people argue we have a two party system is because what's the problem with the third party? Let me rephrase the question. How long do Democrats have to wait, typically, to get back in power? If let's say Donald Trump takes over, has two, controls both houses of Congress and the presidency, how long does it wait? Four years, maybe eight, at the absolute worst, maybe 16 years? And that's assuming Donald Trump's vice president is elected, right? You never really see a long line of Democrat, 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 Democrat president. Or Republican, 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 right? You don't have to wait that long. An elitist conflict paradigm basically suggests Nancy Pelosi probably sits down and has a cocktail with Donald Trump twice a week and they laugh at the idiot that they're <laughs> that they're ruling over. Okay, now we're gonna go out in front of the TV and be really mad at each other. But uh we're still gonna play bridge later, right? Let's see, let me get the okay. Let me see the right there. Right? So it protects the property of the powerful and oppresses political threats. We don't want the third party because that might mean even longer before we maintain power or get back in power, right? Let's just kind of take turns and give the country this kind of semblance of we care and then move on. Donald Trump was a major campaign contributor to Bill Clinton. Donald Trump was an invited guest to Chelsea Clinton's wedding. And I, I believe the Clintons were at Baron Trump's baptism. When Hillary Clinton ran against Donald Trump, was there any semblance of any of that shown? You would have thought that they were mortal enemies locked in combat, right? But for a long time, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump helped get Hillary Clinton elected to the Senate of New York, the Senate seat in New York. The Clintons never lived in New York. And then a Senate seat opened up and Donald Trump said, hey, Hillary, you got a spot for it. Until he decided to run for president, right? And so law is the state's coercive weapon which maintains social and economic order. We just got to argue the reason burglary is illegal is not because everyone agrees that if you own stuff, you should be able to keep it. Because realistically, if you get your bike stolen at Flagler, does anyone care? If you get your laptop stolen at the library, what's going to happen? I don't know if that happens here. UF, if you left to go to the bathroom and left your textbooks or laptop on desk, you would come back three minutes later and everything would be missing. <laughs> There's a situation. And we always do this thing where I would like, you know, go up to the person and be like, hey, will you watch my stuff while I go to the bathroom? It's like, I don't really know a psychopath. I might steal my shit too. But for some reason, if I talk to you, that means I'm safe. But what would happen if, if my stuff got stolen at UF? I call you up, police department, what do they say? Oh, okay. Do they call in the SWAT team and the National Guard and lock down the campus until my stuff is found? 
They surprisingly do not give a shit that my stuff is stolen. If I'm wealthy and my stuff is stolen, though, what happens? The police care, right? When Nicole Brown Simpson was murdered, did the police care? Very much so. When a random person is killed anywhere in America on the streets, what do the police do? Draw a chalk line that washes away at the next rainstorm and move on with their life, right? Elitist conflict theorists would say because who gets murdered is what matters, not that there was a murder, right? It matters a lot more who the victim is. So elitist conflict generally exposes some type of economic, racial, or gender inequality as a driving force for law creation. So I'll point out things like drug laws, or they'll even say things like the workday. Is there a reason why our workday is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Who does that disadvantage generally? Does that disadvantage anybody? I'll give you a hint, not dues. Right. Mothers have a very difficult time with an eight to five workday. Why? You can't leave your kids from eight to five. You can't leave your kids from eight to five, right? What if they're in schooling? What time does school usually start? Eight. eight. Can you drop your kid off at school and get to work at the same time? You can work at the school. That's about it, right? So you either have to drop them off early, and then what happens? What time does school get out? Two or three. What do you do with them? Say, all right, start hitchhiking home? Make yourself a snack? Go kill your brother? So there's arguments, right, from at least conflict perspective. What would happen, right? I, I worked at a criminal defense law office in high school, and there was a, a legal assistant there that was very, very well respected legal assistant at the firm. She got to work at six in the morning because her husband would drop the kids off at school, but she had to leave work every day at 2.30. So she put in the same eight hour day, it just got shifted earlier so that by 2.30 she could be gone to go pick the kids up from school and go home and take care of the kids. But the solution, does that seem like a weird solution? Why, why are people uncomfortable with that idea? Who knows, right? Because we've been told the work is 85. If, if I called in, let's say I had kids, I don't. Oh, thank God. But let's say I had kids, right? If I called into work and said, hey, sorry, my kid's sick, I gotta go home. What more likely than not would people say? Or even, let's say my kid is at school and gets sick. Who are they gonna call? Me or mom? You're gonna call mom, right? Why? Why does mom have to worry about kids and work? Also, when mommy gets home, what's the expectation socially? For mothers, feed the kids, make sure they do their homework, make sure they shower, and get to bed, and make sure your husband gets his photo up. I want you to know, none of those things in my wife's expectation. <laughs> Don't use a little bait and switch after, after we got married. I put up dinner after. So, Elitist conflicts would say there's some sort of economic racial inequality for the purposes or the driving force for law creation. Drug law. Who smokes crack? Predominantly. Poor black people. What do poor white people do? No. Yeah, poor white people. They do meth. Meth is like 98% done by white folks. Crack is predominantly done by black folks. What do rich people do? What drugs do rich people do? Cocaine? What else? Popping Molly and sweating. Woo! Right? I heard that in the rap music. They might do prescription drugs. 
Which drugs do we consider like the bad drugs in society? Math and crap. Why? That is adorable, right? Maybe because how it affects the brain, right? Elitist conflict theorists wouldn't say that. They'd say it's because rich people aren't doing meth and crack. Poor people are. Specifically, right, crack has some of the worst punishments to it. Because poor black people do it. Although if you ever see someone doing meth, it's like you know they're doing meth. We all saw Tiger King, right? Ooh. Ooh, down the but, right, so, so drug laws even, as I've argued, right, I could see, presumably, myself doing fill in the blank, so I don't want to punish that law that harshly, right? We um, just recently had to come up with professional development standards for faculty. The faculty all have to decide what should be our standards to get promoted from assistant professor to associate professor and associate professor to full professor. If you didn't have evidence to support what you thought someone should have to do, it got shot down because if I asked you guys, you guys come up with the assignments of how I'm going to grade you. What assignments would y'all come up with? Probably pretty easy ones. Why? Because why not? Because y'all don't want to punish yourselves. You don't want to come up with a system that ends up punishing you, right? So if I'm in power, I'm going to come up with all sorts of ways to where it doesn't apply to me. When prohibition got voted in, alcohol is illegal in America. Unless you have a prescription for a medical reason. Wouldn't you know that all the politicians suddenly got prescriptions for medical reasons why they needed to drink? When Obamacare got passed, everyone in America had to have either insurance through work or sign up for Obamacare, except Congress. They said, it's really, really good for all of you. We sure as hell don't want it, but you guys are going to love it. Now, leaders conflict theorists would say that's just evidence that they don't actually care about you, they care about themselves. What is the punishment for Obamacare if you didn't sign up? You got fined for it, heavily. So it keeps them in power and lets them maintain their wealth while you don't. If I found out, let's say I own $500,000 in Apple stock, I do not. So let's say I do, and Steve Jobs comes back from the grave, or Tim Cook calls me up and goes, hey, we're about to have a terrible quarter. So I sell all my Apple stock. What can happen to me? You think what kind of What happens if you get a hook on it? The stock says. Uh, that's problematic. But... What's it called? Not outsider. Insider trading. Insider trading. I'm getting a hookup about the stocks that are going to be manipulated. I better dump all my money or dump all my money in if I know something's about to happen. That is illegal for everyone except for who? If I'm a congressman and I happen to own, let's say, a private security company, and I know we're about to go to war, can I help negotiate contracts for my private security company to get a contract with the United States government to help provide security at military bases? You're absolutely right, I can. And guess what the punishment is for that? Nothing. So, a latest conflict theorist would say all of these things are examples of those in power maintaining their power and their wealth while oppressing others. Now, zooming back out, we have consensus and we have conflict. We're going to do a little exercise here as it relates to St. Augustine and something that happened recently in St. Augustine. There was a Confederate monument over here at the grassy area by the Grizzly Lodge, the end of the plaza. Some people loved the monument, some people 
didn't like the monuments so much. And there were big arguments about the purpose of these monuments. People have even pointed out over time historically, look at time the monuments were erected. They were erected right after the Civil War and right after Jim Crow got outlawed. Right? They were erected at times where black people were making huge strides in society. From an elitist perspective, or a conflict perspective, what's the explanation for why those monuments went up at that time? Keep the power in the hands of the powerful. Sure, you're free now, you're not a slave anymore. Sure, we can't legally discriminate against you anymore. But we're going to throw up a bunch of monuments to remind you we're still your dad. Right? From a consensus paradigm, how would a consensus perspective theorists look at that? Is there any way a consensus theorist can look at these things? Any law or any governmental action can be viewed through both lenses. So there is a way that this can be viewed. How would we view it from the, the idea of compromise and cooperation? Basically, right? So you just lost your slaves. Y'all are upset about it. We'll give you a statue. Hey, you just were told you can't be racist anymore. There's a consolation prize. We'll build you an obelisk in the grass. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm not saying that's right. We just have to be able to look at all of these things from these differing perspectives, right? How would a conflict theorist answer this? How would a consensus theorist respond to that thing, right? And so basically, right, a consensus theorist would say everything is a compromise in some capacity. And so how we compromise might look different, but at the time, that was the best compromise we came up with. And that's why it's also important to not try and put the morality of today on actions that happen 100 years ago, either, right? Because obviously, we don't need a, you know, we don't need a Confederate monument in the plaza. I'm totally not suggesting or trying to defend. We need to keep it there for all time, right? At the time, the mayor was like, hey, you guys lost in every possible way. But to keep peace, we'll throw up, a, we'll throw up something for the birds to shit on. Right? That'll make you happy, and that'll calm you all down. Fine. Here's your consolation prize. Y'all still lost, right? So that is probably how a consensus theorist would view why it was during these times of great social change that these things went up. Obviously, a conflict theorist has a very different perspective. Conflict theorists would even say things like murder and burglary, right? Like we talked about. Murder is only there to protect the powerful. That's why it's illegal, not the normal person. So one in this tension between the two. One sees laws as driven by survival and the necessity for people to essentially get along. The other sees it as driven by power and competition. Both are considered ideal types though. So on a spectrum, there is no perfect democracy or perfect dictatorship, right? Everywhere, all these things fall on a spectrum somewhere, right? The same thing is true with conflict versus consensus. In the purest forms, this is how they look. However, we have this broad spectrum. Overwhelmingly, in American society, aren't there the vast majority of laws, the vast majority of people like, you know, that kind of makes sense? Does anyone think it's okay to rape? I shouldn't say anyone. Never say never, but you do. But the vast majority of people think rape is bad, murder is bad, burglary is bad, right? They're not particularly controversial areas. Very small set of laws that we really debate about. So, with that being said, I'll see you all next week.
Go Gators. Go America.